and then we can, we can start. Father, thank you so much for our time of worship so far. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you that you are amongst us. And uh, we pray, Lord, that as we approach your word now, that you would speak, uh, that we would hear your voice. Thank you that you are the God who speaks through his word, that speaks to his people and reveals yourself to us. We ask we would hear your voice um, and that your spirit would speak and we would have ears to hear what you would say to us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I've got a title for this message. I don't always, that's why I felt I had to announce that. But uh, the, the title for this message is Serving God Where He Has Placed You. Sounds not particularly profound. Serving God Where He Has Placed You. Because sometimes in life, we wish we were somewhere else. Or we wish we were at a different stage in our life. To put it another way, sometimes we are not content with our circumstances and our allot in life, our current state of affairs. And perhaps you feel that way tonight. You can look backwards in a, in a nostalgic sort of way. I think nostalgia is a cruel taskmaster, isn't it? We look backwards and we remember some golden time in our life, some stage in our life where things seemed better. I was happier then. Things were good then. Things were more straightforward. I felt more useful then. I felt more used than I do now. Or perhaps you're looking in the opposite direction, you're look, looking forward and you're thinking, once I'm at the next stage of life, then everything will be fine. Everything will be better. I'll, I'll be happier. I'll be serving the Lord more. I'll be, things will just seem better. Different place, different stage of life, whatever that might be. And I say that because in the passage that we're looking at tonight, God's people, the people of Israel, find themselves in a place they certainly did not want to be in. They did not want to be here. This, is, this much is clear. A situation and a stage that they didn't want to be. A place they didn't want to be. And they were wanting someone to come in and say, don't worry, it's all going to be over tomorrow. Pack your bags, boys, we're going home. That's what they wanted to hear. It's not going to be like this for very long. They wanted to be back in their homeland. You see, they were God's chosen people through Abraham, the people of Israel. And his descendants who went to Egypt, were enslaved in Egypt, freed from slavery. God freed them, sent Moses and freed them. And eventually, after a lot of toing and froing and wandering about, they eventually came to the promised land that God had promised them. They entered the land, but when they entered the land, there were conditions on their, them remaining in the land. They were to obey the Lord. They were to walk in his ways. They were to be a light to the nations, a witness to the world around them. And, and God was very clear with them. And they agreed to the terms of the, the agreement. You know, they, they kind of, let's say it's a contract. You know, you signed that and you agreed to this, that, and the next thing. He said, obey me, love me, follow me, worship me alone. Do my will, walk in my ways. And they said, yes, we'll do that. And then they didn't. They did the exact opposite. And it's this descent into chaos, into sin, into worshiping idols, into doing all kinds of wickedness. And God warned them. He said, prophets, the one who said, you, you know what happens if you disobey, just read Deuteronomy. He says, I will discipline you. I will send judgment because you're supposed to be my people. And that would be for their good. But they didn't listen. They didn't listen. They didn't listen. They refused to repent and turn back to God. And so what's happened by the time we get to this stage in Jeremiah, what God has promised. You see, God, God's a God of his word, whether we like the message or not. But he sent the Babylonians to take the Israelites into exile, away from the homeland. Some were still there, but most have been taken away into Babylon. They've been carried off, away from the promised land, so that they might return to him again, so that they might be disciplined, that they might learn, and that they might be reminded of their need to worship God and walk in his ways, because that is what's best for them, to learn to worship him again and not to do what is right in their own eyes, as they did with the judges, but to do right in God's. But for them in this moment, what that means is they've been taken away from home. Foreign land, enemy territory, no less, the Babylonians. They'd been humiliated and removed from their home in exile. And they just want to go back. They want to go back. I wish we were back here. And the false prophets were coming and saying, yes, the Lord has told me. It was so unwise to do that because it was never going to happen. The Lord has told me we're going to go back soon. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. And they wanted to be told that. They wanted to hear this. But Jeremiah, the Lord's true prophet, who experienced a lot of persecution because he spoke the truth, says, no, that's not going to happen. Here's what God is saying. 
and the message he gives in this letter that is sent to the exiles from Jerusalem, this is what God is saying. And he's saying, God has brought you here. Serve the Lord here and now where he has placed you. Settle down and get on with it. And that's really the message of the sermon is to serve God where he has placed you. In the, I suppose in the place and in some ways in the time that he has placed you as well. Through this letter he brings them the word of God. And so what does he say in the actual contents of this letter? Verses 1 to 3 give us the details of some of the, how the letter got to them. In verse 4 he reminds them that it is God that has sent them here. God has placed them here. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So on the one hand, as it happened, this, as this literally happened, it was the Babylonians that came and took them and carried them back in. If you, if you were a, an Israelite in this moment, you got removed from the land, you'd say, no, no, I definitely remember the Babylonians came charging over the hill and pillaged the place and then took us back to be there and that and he did of course they did but behind this event god was acting god was judging his people god sent the babylonians to bring them into exile so he's saying in a sense god sent you there primarily we often see this coming up again in the scriptures where it's this kind of mysterious paradox where on the one hand um, people are responsible for their actions they make choices but equally in god's mysterious and wise providence he brings about his purposes through it it's a glorious thing. Last uh, Sunday morning, I mentioned Joseph, you know, in Genesis, who had a right rough time here, you know, being sold into slavery by your own brothers. It's brutal. And he's taken to Egypt, not what he wanted at all. Bit of a roller coaster ride, horrible accusations against him, ends up in prison, uh, but then rises to prominence within Egypt. And of course, he tells his brothers that these, all these Egyptians have been saved from the famine because I was brought here. And he says, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. There's that mystery going on there. Even Jesus' death on the cross, it's spoken about in such a way that, <clears throat> yes, those who put Jesus to death, they put Jesus to death. But even in doing that, God's plan was accomplished. His purposes were achieved. And Christ was crucified so that he might, so that we might be saved. And here we have something similar, Babylon. This great power, evil power, takes God's people into exile. And yet in the same way, the Lord can actually say, I sent you. I sent you there. My plans, my purposes were brought to bear, were brought to pass. And they needed to hear that, didn't they? This isn't an accident, you know. They knew, it's like God can say, you knew this would happen. Time and time again, I told you. Repent, turn to me again. If you didn't follow me yet, even now, even though they have rebelled against him, God is mercifully, lovingly disciplining them and showing them his grace and doing what's necessary to bring them back to him into a right relationship with him. Now, sometimes in our lives, I think to put it into today, we can uh, look around and wonder if somewhere along the line, God dropped the ball. Or that something happened that he didn't realize. It kind of went under the radar in our lives and kind of thought, what was the purpose in that? What's the point of that? And how is any of this fit fitting into his plan? I ask those questions. But we're reminded that God is sovereign and he's in control of all things. And he sent you where you are today. He placed you where you are today. He has placed you where you are. His eye is on you and he cares for you. They are not circumstances out with his control. He has sent you and placed you here. And in the, the stage that you are at in your life or wherever you might be. And it can be tempting to dream about another place. The, the greener grass syndrome kicks in a bit sometimes, doesn't it? And you think looking over the fence or just thinking maybe if it was a bit different, it would be fine. He says, don't dream about some other place or phase in your life. He has placed you here. We are his exiles where he has placed us. As you might be thinking, well, I, I'm not a Jewish exile in Babylon, actually. You know, I, I live in Stonehaven in the 21st century, but we are described in other parts of the Bible in the New Testament as exiles. 
and strangers. Aliens sometimes. It doesn't feel very nice to be called an alien most times, but in the Bible it means, you know, it's not like an alien in an extraterrestrial sense of the word, but we get called aliens. We're strangers. We're exiles. This isn't our home. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you know, Peter's writing to people who were experiencing the cost of being a Christian and the trial and the struggle and the difficulty, even persecution. And he writes to them and reminds them, yeah, that's because this is not your ultimate home. He says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as if something strange were happening. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. See those Old Testament references. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So we're not exiles in the sense of the Old Testament Israelites. We're exiles in the sense that we've been saved by Christ through his death, his resurrection, and brought into this kingdom of light. And so we live in his kingdom as citizens of his kingdom, of the kingdom that is to come. And yet we live here as strangers and exiles. And so we experience that this is not truly our home. <coughs> this is not our age. This kingdom is not our kingdom. We are citizens of another on our way home, so to speak. And we will be brought home by our Lord. So the Lord has sent the Israelites into this place. So with that in mind, God has sent you to this place. What are you to do, Israelites, in this place? They'll be thinking, well, you've sent us here. What do we do? Well, the letter tells them what to do. They might be thinking, are we going to overthrow the regime and take over? Have a good revolution. Have one of those. Uh, no, he says something that's actually surprising when you read the letter. And I think it would have surprised some Israelites reading this. He basically tells them to settle down. You know, he basically gives them those instructions that parents kind of give their kids, you know. Basically, what I want you to get a good job, find a good spouse, have some children, buy a house, you know, all this sort of normal stuff that sounds kind of boring in some ways. It's not boring, as we know, but it doesn't sound particularly exciting. He's, you know, you can almost, I can wait for the Israelites waiting for something, to, you know, like what's he going to say? He says, no, settle down, uh, you know, get married, build houses, plant gardens. Have kids, multiply, go forth and multiply. All the stuff that they've been told since Genesis, basically, to keep doing that, you're just going to do it in this place instead. The whole message here behind these instructions, and if you uh, read them there, he, he says to them, take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. <coughs> the message behind these instructions is embrace this accept this message accept where you are be present there put down roots settle down this is where it's it's sort of re-emphasizing the fact that you're going to be here a while so you might as well settle down and be a witness where we've placed you don't listen to like hananiah in the previous chapter who's trying to tell you you're, go you're going home tomorrow you know no wait around uh, settle down Worship the Lord there. Live here. Don't think you're going back. Not for 70 years. So get on with life here and be my people in this place. You can still be my people here. You can still worship here. That might have felt revolutionary to them because they were away from all the normal places where they would worship. But you can be my people in this place. You can worship me here and be a witness for me here. Live out his commandments. Worship him together as the community of God's people. Shine a light in this dark a wicked nation. And maybe draw some others to come and worship him too. On a Sunday mornings, I've still got, still got one Philemon sermon to go. Um, managed to get four out of Philemon. But we've only got one, one sermon left in Philemon. And I think we're going to start in Joshua. So um, I say that tentatively because I've said stuff like that before. And then they're a completely different book. But I'm pretty sure we're going to Joshua. But one of the things that strikes me is that when they go to take the land, those within the land, some within the land, they're not Israelites but they're kind of drawn to these people because they've heard of what God has done. 
and they've heard of what God has done through them. You know, Rahab the prostitute, you know, the Gibeonites, these people who are drawn into the community, God's people. And it's almost as if in this place in Babylon there, it could be that witness, that light uh, in this dark place in the way that they live and the way that they respond and treat those around them. And isn't it amazing that their worship of God, their obedience to God can be displayed in the ordinary stuff of life. I find that so liberating as a Christian to know that part of our witness is doing the ordinary things in a godly and a gracious and a light shining sort of way. Settling down the way they treat their spouse, the way you treat your children, the way that you work. Sometimes in our lives, as you know, I think in Christ, as Christians today, we're living in a time when we look, I mentioned it before, we can kind of look down on the seemingly ordinary stuff, you know, wanting to be sort of radical or wanting to be this or that, and, and those are good intentions, but we forget the importance of the day-to-day -day and how God cares about the way we do those things. You know, we, we sometimes feel just ordinary. Well, you know, I'm doing my job and if I'm married and I've had children and I'm kind of living my life, is it, is it significant? Am I doing enough? Does it matter? Yet so often it's the way in which we do those things. It's the seemingly ordinary things, the way we worship as families and as churches, the way we live our lives before God. In our words and in our deeds and just how we go about things that just draws people, that catches people's attention. You can be a witness in those ordinary things, in those normal day-to-day -day bits and bobs. And it's often through a humble servant that God shines a light to the world around them. The kind of quiet witness that just goes about their day and seeks to serve God and speak to people and be present with people. That has a bigger impact on folk than we think. And yes, we are to do things that make us uncomfortable. Take risks. Live sacrificial lives for Christ. But never underestimate your witness in these ordinary things as you seek to be a good citizen in, and take part in the place that God has set you. And what these verses remind us is that we are called to be holy, set apart for God, but not to live away from the world, not to hide away in holy huddles or in monasteries or whatever the case might be. Jesus said that, doesn't he say, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you keep them from the evil one. I want, you to keep, I want them in the world to be a witness. Sometimes it can be tempting to hide away, can't it? When the world just gets more complicated and, and it just seems to be so far from the truth of God's word and you're like, I don't even know how to handle half of this stuff. It would be easier just to kind of hide away in my, my ivory tower somewhere. It's less complicated. Okay, I don't have to deal with it. But no, God has sent us into the world as his people, Christ's people. We fight compromise, we fight sin and worldliness, but we are to reach those around us to be present in the world that Jesus called us into. And Jesus himself embodied and lived just being amongst people. To enjoy the good gifts that God has given us in this world without worshipping them. Maybe one of the greatest witnesses in a Christian life. I enjoy God's good gifts, but they're not everything to me. Are you present where God has placed you? He calls these people to settle down where they are. Invest. Be there. Be involved. He continues this idea by saying, don't just settle down and accept where you are and sort of like, right, I'll just kind of grin and bear it. We'll just put up with it, you know. But he says, actively seek the welfare of the city. <laughs> seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, he says in verse 7. Uh, they're thinking... Wait, hang on, this is the enemy. These are the people who have just pillaged our city and taken us away. Why would we seek the welfare of the city? We don't particularly like these people. This is the enemy. <coughs> this is Babylon. Like, seek its welfare. Are you kidding me? Why would we do that? Some of them would have been hoping for a Sodom and Gomorrah sort of situation. You know, I read about that in Genesis. Jeremiah, can we not have a bit of that old, good old-fashioned hellfire coming down and like burning the place up and uh, Jeremiah saying no you don't want to do that because this is now your city so if if it goes up in flames you go up in flames as well which is why he says to them seek the welfare of the city for in its welfare you'll find your welfare now that the word behind that is actually that shalom that peace which is more than just the sort of absence of conflict it's an all-round harmony and blessing and abundance seek the shalom of that city of that place where you are. Because that's your city now. 
Yeah, 70 years, this is where you're going to be. Seek it, because if you seek that to be a blessing to these people, it'll be a blessing to you because you're uh, living there. This is where you are now. They were to live as good citizens, even though this was not their true home. This was not ultimately their home. They knew they were going back. And so are we in the way we work and the extra things we do in the community, into the community, those avenues, those places where we can come in as a Christian witness and be that blessing, that presence. I was just thinking the other night, Rona has been serving them. I got invited to the parent teachers council meeting kind of thing. And that's, that's no small thing, being present in those places. Rona has been on that for years. You know, it's an example of just being there and being a, an encouraging and, a, and a, a positive voice into these situations, being a Christian presence. It's no small thing. Those things like this can be um, a real blessing to the place around us as we seek the welfare of schools, we seek the welfare of families, we seek the welfare of those around us. Another example of this might be the way in which we vote. Voting's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes you get around and you think, oh, I quite like that one. And other times you get, I have no idea who to vote for here, but I'll go for the, the maybe the, the best of a bad bunch, is that the phrase they use kind of thing? Because why are we doing that? Well, we want what's best for the place in which we live, for ourselves, but for those around us as well. We seek the welfare of those around us. More than that, we are to pray. They were to pray. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you find your welfare. They're thinking, praying for these people. You want me to pray for these people that have just stripped us, taken us from our homes, kidnapped us, this evil power. Hard to imagine praying for them. Yet doesn't Jesus call us to a similar thing? To love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. I often think in my context, I, I think of people, you know, that maybe annoy me because I'm not, in an, I'm not being actively persecuted in the way that others are. So praying for people who annoy me outside the church, I can do that, you know, kind of thing. But you think of the people who are actually Christians whose lives are on the line on a day-to-day -day basis. And Jesus says, pray for those people who might try and kill you today. That's, that's just, it's mind-blowing, but that's what God calls us to in many ways to pray for those who might hate us. But we pray for wherever we are. We pray for Stonehaven, and Aberdeen, and this nation in which God has placed us. We pray that it would be blessed and we pray for their salvation, that they would come to know Christ. It's one of the brutally honest things about the book of Jonah, isn't it, when you read about Jonah. See, I grew up thinking you, you kind of either explicitly or implicitly get the message that Jonah was a bit scared of his task. Now, Jonah, I don't doubt, was scared of his task. But actually, Jonah just didn't like the Ninevites. That was the problem. He was raging with God at the end of the day. And they repented. And you forgave them. I didn't want you to forgive them. And he actually quotes the Bible to him and says, says, this is why I didn't want to come. Because I know you're a God who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, as if that were a bad thing. You know, like he's, he's like, as I knew you were going to forgive the Ninevites because you're, you're all gracious in that, you know. And Jonah wasn't. He was so angry because they're our enemies. I don't like them. But, but the Lord cared for their souls more than Jonah ever could. The Lord cares for the lost more than uh, the most compassionate and loving Christian ever could. But we pray, we want people around us to be saved. We want people around us to know Christ, don't we? It breaks our hearts when we look out and we see lost people and we think, goodness, but for the, literally, but for the grace of God, go I. We want people to know him. Maybe Paul's words to Timothy help us understand these kind of things in our context, where he says, first of all, then, I urge that prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. I might actually read more of that than I was intended to. For kings, all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. For this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. We pray for the welfare of those around us. We pray for the salvation of those around us because we have a saviour in Christ, the one mediator, 
between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We pray that as we witness people come to know him as their saviour and lord as we are present in this place. And these are, So these are God's positive instructions through Jeremiah and they come with a warning. A warning not to listen to those who say otherwise. Verses 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners um, deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie they're prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. You see, in chapter 29, you see Hananiah, the false prophet, try to tell them we're, we're going home soon. Like I said, pack the bags. We're off. And, and they were told not to listen to him. And there's always this temptation in the Old Testament to, for them to listen to the ones that they want. I, I love, I think it's in Kings somewhere, where uh, there's this one prophet, there's a king, and I, I'm just saying off the cuff, so I can't quite remember all the details, but the king who uh, loved to line up all the prophets who just told them what he wanted to hear. And there's this one guy, Micaiah, I think his name is, and he says, I hate that guy. And I hate that guy because he tells me what I don't want to hear. It's really funny to read it. And so there's this one thing where he bring, brings him up. Uh, he hears all the prophets, lines them all up, and they say, I'm going to go into battle. Am I going to win? And they all say, yes, yes, you're going to win because they don't want, they know if they say no, they'll get a bad treatment. And they, and they wheel up. I said, and somebody says, there's not another one. He says, oh, yeah, that's that guy, but I hate that guy. He says, why? Because he always tells me what I don't want to hear. So they wheel up Mickey Eye and he sort of says, uh, and, he, and he jokingly, I think, says, yeah, you're going to win. And they say, you don't mean that, do you? He says, no, you're going to lose. You're going to lose the battle if you go into the battle. He says, see, I told you, you were going to tell me what, what you didn't want to hear. And he gets chucked in prison for that. Uh, but there's that temptation in all of us, isn't there, to like, I want you to tell me what I want to hear. I want, I want God to say this. Does that sound familiar in any way? Notice that Jeremiah calls them, God calls them your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, because they're not mine. I didn't send them. I don't know who's there, but they, well, he doesn't know who's there, but they're not mine. And sometimes we can want someone to tell us the news we want to hear and say, thus says the Lord. We want to hear this. Now God speaks. God speaks through his word. God speaks through people. He brings his messages to us. <clears throat> But sometimes we can, because we're discontent with where we are, we want to be at the next stage. We say, Lord, just send me somewhere else. Just tell me that spouse is sort of just around the corner, or the kids are coming soon, or I'm going to get that job, or just that, that illness is going to be taken away. It's going to be over soon. I've been in positions before where I was so unhappy with where I was. I didn't realize it at the time. I would open my daily devotion, like actually hoping that God was going to give me this message this morning that's going to say, time to move on, sort of thing. How pathetic is that? You know, I'm sitting there waiting for, it's not, that's not the point of your daily devotions. Like, God, just tell me what I want to hear right now this morning so I can get on with it and I'll be all happy and stuff. And it's like, and it, you look back and think, what on earth was I thinking? But it, you want God to give, I want to give me a word concerning this specific situation now. And it's, it's even more amusing when God tells you what you actually need to hear. You're, oh, I'm not sure I yeah, I'm not sure I wanted that one as much. But God speaks in his word to us absolutely. And he speaks into our circumstances. But often we become fixated on what we want. That we don't listen for what he's actually saying. And there will be self-proclaimed prophets who will say, The Lord told me this is going to happen in your life. And it might. It might happen. Something might happen. But be wary of those who bring messages for what Paul calls itchy ears. You know, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to say what they want to say. Be suspicious of those who tell you all the time, this is, um, tell you what you want to hear all the time. We are not short of Ananias or others in our day. And we check the word. We say, is it in line with God's word? And hey, this could happen, but we might be wary. But we do look for the Lord and we listen to him in his word. Because with this warning, there's also a promise. They might have been told what they don't want to hear, that God has you in this place. And they would learn contentment as time went on, I'm sure, and realize, yes, this is God's plan for us. But along with this instructions and the warning comes a promise and a very hopeful one for them indeed. He says, don't listen to them because they're 70 years ahead. So yes, you better settle down. Or you're going to be waiting a very long time. Long 70 years. Most of you probably wouldn't even, even see it. Because you know, some of them would be older anyway. But when this time is over. When my purposes are achieved. 
I'll bring you back to the land. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you home. And the Lord kept his word, and he did. You can read about it in Scripture when uh, he uses puppets like Cyrus, powerful people, uh, to uh, say to send the people back to the land. You go home and you rebuild your temple, and you go back to the land. The Lord kept his word. Because you see in verse 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, for welfare and not for evil, <coughs> to give you a future and a hope. He knew the, his plan for these people. He knew what they needed in this moment. They needed discipline. They needed work done. Because he says, then you will call upon my name and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. See, what's that about? You see, the thing is, it's not about trying to be somewhere else or at some other stage. The question is, are you seeking God where you are now? Because he is there. He is present with us now. Whether that's joy, whether that's trial, he is there. When it is hard, the evil one whispers, doesn't he? He says, God's not good. He says, did God really say that? Did God keep his word? God said he'll never leave you or forsake you. Yet he seems to have done that. But then God says, no, no, I am there. I never leave my people. I never forsake them. I never abandon them. I am present with them. But God has your best interests at heart. You see, God, God cares more about your worship of him and your obedience to him and about your godliness in your circumstances rather than the circumstances themselves. Trust me, he cares about your circumstances far more than probably you do. But what he's concerned about is, are you uh, worshipping me there? Are you living for me there? Are you praising me there, even in the pain, even in the difficulty? Because you see, when it came to the people of Israel, he was more concerned about them returning to him than returning to the land. That was, that was why they'd been taken out of the land, because they'd wandered from him. He says, once you return to me, and you seek me with all your heart, and you pray to me, and you actually love me, then you can go back to the land. Because it's not really about the land, it's returning to the Lord. Return to him first, then you can return to the land. He cares most importantly that we seek him in whatever situation we find ourselves today. And that's not to um, be flippant about people's trials or difficulties or circumstances, but it's to encourage and comfort that God is there and he is in our midst and he walks with us through all of these things. And you know, the people of Israel, they had a great promise here. You're going to come back to the land. You're going to come back to the land, just not yet. We have an even greater one, a much greater one. He promises to bring us home, to bring us to our land, to bring us to where we belong. We won't be exiles and aliens and strangers and weirdos anymore. We'll be brought back into the presence of God in this renewed land. If we die before he comes, then we enter into the presence of our master. We enter into the joy of our Lord. Like Paul, what does he say? I'd, be, I'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And elsewhere for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. I'd rather be away, he says, but for your sake, I'll st stick around a while. And for, for anybody here or anyone watching this, that might be your thing. You might think, I'm ready to go home. And the Lord might be saying, not yet. Soon, but, but not yet. You've got work to do first. If we die before we get to be with him, and should he return before then, we will be with him forever in this redeemed creation, this new heavens and new earth, this new land. What a day that will be, won't it? Glorious in our home with him forever. So whoever you are tonight, whether you don't know Jesus yet, seek him. This one who has given himself for you, who has died for your sins and risen again so he might bring you into his kingdom, into his home and your eternal home to give you a certain hope and future, and future peace, future shalom beyond anything we could have in this life. A great future and a hope. To our brother and sister in Christ tonight, uh, I think all of us at times experience times of discontentment. 
times where we're just worn out, or we've had enough, or ready for the next thing, or we're unsettled, we don't know what to do. You may be the opposite. You may be enjoying contentment in Christ where he has placed you. Whatever the situation at the moment, what is God's will for you? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen even tonight. I, I have no idea what God will do in your life over the next few years. I'm not going to be saying he's going to send you here, he's going to send you there. God knows. He might take you somewhere else. He might say remain here because he does sometimes call us to move on, doesn't he? But uh, he, whatever the case, where you are today, you can serve him. Begin by seeking him where you are in the time and the place he has set you. He cares about you and he sees everything that's going on in your life, heart and mind. And he cares most importantly that you seek him and find him where you are. Love and obey him in this exile in which we find ourselves. Wherever he may have placed you and whatever he has given your hand to do, do it in obedience to him, seeking him always, praying to him, calling on his name, being that light and witness to the world around you. Settling down and putting your roots down, but always looking ahead to the future, to our great hope and the return of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of this world into your kingdom. Uh, undeserving, once we had not received mercy, now we have received mercy in your son, Jesus. For that we praise you. Lord, we want to thank you for the great future and hope that we have ahead. What a glorious future we have to look forward to because of your son, the Lord Jesus, who gave himself for us. The one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. May we find joy in that, may we be trusted in that. Would you help us, Lord, to seek you in the circumstances in which we find ourselves, in the time, in the place, whatever it might be. Thank you that you are with us in that, that you see those things, that you care about those things, that you care about what you have given us to do, that, that it, our lives matter to you, our work matters to you, our families matter to you, this place matters to you. And as we witness in the place in which you have set us, help us to settle, help us to find avenues and ways of witness, Lord, to seek the welfare of the city, to pray for it, Lord. We, and we pray again tonight for your spirit to be poured out on this place. We pray for this place to be filled, not for our glory, but for your glory, um, because it is your church and it is your will that we want to do. So um, help us to be that witness and may you move in power in this place, we ask. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for making us your own. Thank you that you know the plans you have for us that we have a great future and a hope ahead. Thank you for this great Saviour Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.